everyone. My name is Stephanie Boozer with CUGC HQ, and I am very happy to welcome you to today's user share. We have a Synergy presentation that if you missed it or you actually attended it and just have more questions and want to see it again, we're very excited to have it uh, for us today on uh, preventing possible PBS pain points. Just really quickly, for those of you who might be new to our community, we do have over 16,000 members around the globe, as well as uh, 60 plus local user groups and special interest groups. So we'd like to encourage you to scoot on over to mycgc.org if you haven't yet. Uh, fill out your profile, find your local group, and uh, start uh, looking around. And there's a lot of information out there for you. Our format today will be a presentation with Q&A throughout, so we encourage you to type your questions into the question area of the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll keep an eye on those and take periodic breaks to, to take a look and answer some questions. Also, we are recording this presentation today, and you will receive a link to it uh, tomorrow via email, and you'll be able to watch it on demand anytime. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Andrew Wood and Jim Moyle to uh, introduce themselves and get us started. Lovely. Thank you very much, Stephanie. You all right, Jim? Yeah, yeah, I'm not bad. How are you, Andy? I am I am trying to work out which screen to share. There we go. Is that good? Well, what, while you do awesome. that, while awesome. you do that. I'm just going to correct Stephanie. So the first error of the entire presentation is in the first couple of slides. So Stephanie You're said that sparkling that water. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie said uh, that uh, yeah. this is the same presentation as Synergy. That is incorrect because what we have done is we have updated and we have got new material and uh, we've got new things to show you. So uh, even if you saw the Synergy one, this will be some of it at least will be new to you. Some Even of it will be better. new. To yes, and uh, obviously, if you're in uh, like at Synergy, if you're in the wrong session, if you're expecting something different, stick around, have some fun. Uh, hopefully, you'll learn something new. All right. Oh, there we go. Well, right. Yeah. Might as well start. Happy days. We'll start. <laughs> I'll, I'll not do the reveal, shall I? Um, uh, normally housekeeping. Stephanie's done the housekeeping as well as the mistake. Uh, and then I said, well, we should have a hashtag, Jim. We should always have a hashtag for, for people to hashtag and keep up uh, events on Twitter. Uh, how long a hashtag can you have? That long. I'm quite proud of that. Um, 139 characters. So if you use a hashtag, you can... You, you can you can tweet one character out. It's brilliant. It, yes, it, yes, yes. Anywho, who are we? So uh, my name is Jim Moyle. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jim Moyle. Uh, I work for Atlantis Computing. I'm part of uh, the CTP community, and I also help run the UK Citrix user group. And my name's Andrew Wood, uh, at Andy M. Wood on Twitter. By all means, drop me a line. I, too, am a Citrix technology professional. I, too, help out with the UK Citrix user group. If you are in the UK or would be into the UK around the 6th of July, uh, that's our next event uh, down in London at the Barbican. Be lovely to see you if you've not been before. It'd be lovely to see you if you have been before. Hope to see you there. If you live in America, fly over. It's no problem. Uh, or, or fly over if you live in Europe or in yeah. Ireland. Yeah, we've only got 45 minutes though, mate. We should crack on. So, PVS, uh, preventing pain was in PVS. PVS is, hopefully, as you will know, a very popular deployment method for Citrix installs um, and Citrix deployments. There was a recent survey from the VDI Like a Pro website uh, that sticks. Citrix provisioning services, PVS, way out in front of all of the deployment methods uh, that you could have in your particular environment. So if you're looking at this, really, uh, you want to take away that PVS is twice as popular as MCS, even now. Even now. The uh, Citrix has a customer experience improvement program, and we had some insight uh, from a different session that was going on at Synergy into that using provisioning. Uh, and from that data, I think, uh, let me have a quick look at the stats. Uh, there was about 
uh, just shy of 9,000 unique Zenapp Zen Desktop instances and about 5,500 PVS farms. I would expect that 95% of farms only have one site. Now that's interesting. We did a bit of a survey on this, didn't we, Jim, for uh, the last session that we that we went. This seems to fit with what people had in their particular environments. Uh, relatively small number of servers, relatively small number of collections, and only one site. You would think, therefore, that that's the same across the board. What I think is more like the uh, CEIP, the people who actually sign up to this because this is opt-in, uh, tend to be smaller farms. That said, yep. there's still some interesting information. 97% of servers have one NIC. This used to be a big thing. Um, lots of people would consider having the PVS uh, delivery mechanism on its own dedicated network. That's in, with modern networking, that should be uh, less of a requirement. One NIC should be all the NICs that you need. 85% are using local stores. Uh, this sounded out, rounded out with people that we've been looking at. Be interesting if you've got some feedback, by all means, stick them in the questions if that's in agreement with that. But 85% are using local storage rather than network storage. And most people appear to be using Pixie as the delivery method rather than BDM, although uh, when we were talking to some uh, to the people at the Irish Citrix user group last week, uh, larger sites seem to prefer BDM, just because it removes the complexity of uh, pixie delivery at scale. Take it right, Kush. Yeah, sounds about, sounds sensible as far as I'm concerned. And then there's this. 34%, 34% are using server-side cache as the provisioning methodology. That's a very high number. And if we wanted to, to offer a, a fix for a particular environment, Making sure that your environment doesn't have this enabled for live users would be key. So one of the things about this that I was wondering is that uh, until fairly recently, um, even because service side cache was the fallback, if something was wrong with cache on device hard drive or overflow, etc., it would fall back to cache on server. But it wouldn't tell you when you were booting up. Uh, now it does now. But in older versions, it didn't. So if somebody has accidentally fallen back to server-side cache and not realised it, which I have seen in quite a few uh, quite a few organisations, then this might be catching that as well. Yes. So I've come across customers who were experiencing some users who had difficulties, and when they investigated, it was because the caching method had been set incorrectly. So a, a very simple check. If you've got some performance issues, uh, check that you're not actually using server-side cache for the delivery mechanism. But this is, as, as I say, for the CIP, possibly it's smaller sites. Larger sites, though, how would you deliver that? Jim? So um, I recently did a project which was 112,000 uh, users. Um, about 22,000 were persistent and 80,000 were non-persistent. Now, uh, Citrix advice and all of the technologies involved in the stack also advise to do a pod design for this. So what ended up happening is that we chose a, a rack as a pod and each uh, blade enclosure was, uh, was a thousand users. So with three blade enclosures, there was 3,000 users and we did uh, some hyperconverged storage across those three enclosures to <coughs> provide the management stack, so all the PVS servers, vCenters, etc., etc. So really, the only thing coming out of that rack should be a small amount of management traffic and ICA. Um, <clears throat> now, when you've got 80,000 non-persistent users and your pod is 3,000 users, so you've got 20 odd, 30 individual sites, individual separate farms. So what this means is that you can't have somebody pushing buttons to set up all of these different sites. You need to have consistency across the sites to stop configuration drift. So very important to, to automate in this particular occasion. Indeed. Uh, so, and that's going to be a key, I think, going forward, is it not? Um, just to properly throw, Stephanie, if you were at the Synergy event, you won't have noticed this because this wasn't in the deck. Um, Dan Feller does some excellent uh, work providing uh, Visio Sentinels. 
around about March, April time, he released an updated Visio uh, stencil, Citrix stencil set with the PVS accelerator, uh, which you put on his end server environments, which you can see in the diagram there. And I think recently he's also done some updated slides around the net scaler. So if you are documenting your environment or you're planning out a serious environment and want to do that in Visio, uh, make use of Dan Thelis slides. Um, really useful resource, really helpful. But back to specifically the PVS piece, we're going to look at some pain points. So we've looked at, or we consider that PVS is still probably the, the it's still the predominant uh, delivery mechanism. But as Jim says, at scale, or even in small environments, ensuring consistency across all of your farms or across all of your delivery mechanisms, if, if you're delivering for different customers or you've got different sites each with their own PVS instances, is key. And what we're going to try and do today is provide you with a set of tools to ensure uh, against inconsistent images, to ensure against misconfiguration, unknown and uh, undocumented changes the inability to revert changes consistently and hopefully improve uh, log on and, and network performance in your environment. Because ultimately you want a better work-life balance and you want to be able to take a nap which was uh, spoken about a lot at Synergy. So drive automation, drive consistency in your PVS environment to allow you to relax uh, whenever it is that you need to relax. If anybody's wondering, Andy is the one on the right asleep while he's meant to be presenting, but uh, same old, same old. Same old, same old, yes. All right then, so <clears throat> we have uh, talked about, in the past for PVS pain, for, pain points, uh, talking about uh, storage and performance, but what we're going to talk about here is automation of the image build. So yes, you've got your PVS environment that's delivering, that, that's set up to deliver the service, and the service that it's delivering is going to be Windows 10 images, Windows 7 images, or 2012 setup instances. How can you automate that image build uh, for consistent delivery? Now, you might consider, why do I really need to do uh, an image build? Because I've got versioning built into PVS. Well, versioning is all well and good, all fine and dandy, and it's a feature that's above and beyond MCS. But there might come an instance where you need to roll back for whatever reason. Maybe there's an issue with a particular update. Maybe there's uh, a problem that you've found. How do you roll back into a, in a consistent manner? And how do you roll forward? So it's not the versioning that's within PVS, but how can you ensure that there's a consistent and reliable image deployed out of the box? There are a couple of tools, free tools, uh, that you can make use of to do that. Uh, Aaron Parker at Stealth Puppy has a hands off my goal build, a really uh, detailed, impressive piece of work that talks you through using MDT, uh, the Microsoft tool, in order to build out a scripted, automated Windows deployment that you can use to create that base image that you then deliver um, using PVS. And Zen at Blog has also got a really useful walk, walk through uh, for automated master image creation. So in this tool, he talks about automating the process of, of, a, of a build and then applying the updates to it so that you can have a regular recurrence of Windows updates being applied so that the build that you're deploying is the build uh, with the most recent updates and you've automated that process. There's been no hands-on, there's been no script followed, there's been no manual intervention, all of that is automatic. Uh, Xanablog also has a very neat uh, automated framework. I think you have, to, uh, you have to pay for that, don't you, Jim, if I remember rightly? Yes, yes, you do. Nice across the thing. But the automated framework sets up the MDT environment, sets up the Windows, so sets everything up. It's very, very impressive, but it is paid for. These two tools are three. All right, so you've got your build. Is there anything else that you can have on? Whenever you've done a build, one of the things that you might you likely want to do is run sdelete. You might want to remove some temporary files. You might want to run a defrag. How, is there a tool available that allows you to do all of that automatically, automate that particular process? And uh, Matthias 
uh, has the base image script framework, a free tool, uh, downloadable from the link, uh, that you can put into your image that will do all of those sort of like post post build but pre deployment tasks. You can automate all, integrate it with Active Directory, all good, all automatic, no manual intervention. And then you've got the uh, VMware Windows 10 optimization tool that you can download from VMware in order to optimize your Windows 10 environment, which the good people from uh, Login VSI have taken and then optimized again and further. Now, when we presented this at Synergy, there wasn't really a Citrix equivalent. So VMware are optimizing the environment, Login VSI have done some good work optimizing the optimizations, but there wasn't a Citrix tool that did that. There were signups for betas. Earlier on in the week, it was found out that uh, it, was, it was released that that uh, beta testing is ongoing, but it's now accessible for everyone. Indeed, if you are to go to that particular link, uh, article CTX 224676, you can download that tool and have a play about with it. I'd, I'd hope to try and give you that, but as it was only released today, I haven't had a chance to have a full look at it. Uh, maybe we can come back later and talk through that particular tool. Yeah, when I just Googled that CTX number, it's so new that Google hadn't even crawled that website yet. So there that is go. very, very fresh off the press. Hot um, off is, the press. It is it is behind the login, and we had did check that both Andy and uh, my logins work to download that beta. Uh, your mileage may vary, uh, but it should be available, I hope, to anybody who's got a Citrix login. Yes. Cool. Uh, it looks to be PowerShell, number of modules, run the tool. So potentially that's the type of thing that be brought into the uh, base image script framework piece in order to do your optimization to optimize it further. So, we've talked about optimizing the actual build of the Windows 10, Windows 7, 2012, 2016 builds. But what about the service itself? What about the PVS instance? So, you just to interrupt you there, Andy. Do a... Oh, yeah, mate. Yeah, uh, we didn't mention. Uh, as well as long as well as this session being recorded, so you can view the record, recordings, uh, the deck will be available. So, you don't need to screenshot or try and... Uh, write down all these links, you can get the PowerPoint presentation and you can copy and paste from there, so don't worry about that. Absolutely. Well, it's the type of thing that we should have done. We'll edit that in post. We'll stick that, yeah. we'll take that piece and we'll put it right at the beginning. That'd be fine. Um, so you're doing your automated install. Uh, there is documentation on the Citrix website about how to do a silent install of PBS. Uh, this example is for 7.13. If you've got 7.12 or 7.11, just change the numbers. It was interesting though, if you look through this documentation as to how how it works and interacts because not all people read the documentation fully. Do they Jim? No, no. When I tried to have a look at this uh, previously, uh, I ran the, uh, the CLI tool with slash question mark, usually expecting some parameter help to come back to me. Uh, and it didn't come back with anything, so I had to go back to the documentation and actually read it this time instead of skimming it. And it turns out that the help uh, plus the output uh, goes to app data, which is a hidden directory. It's perhaps uh, not the most intuitive place to output things, uh, but that's where it does, and it does say so in the uh, docs. Was there anybody else who fell for this particular little wrinkle, Andy? Yes. Are, are you? Uh, yes. Yes. I, I. I might have done exactly the same thing as well. So I think. <laughs> I think the learning from that is uh, read the documentation fully. Uh, but what I would say um, is, if you want to understand all, so essentially the process, if you've not done the process before, is to do the installation of the PBS console, to do the installation of the PBS service files, and then you run the configuration wizard. So in a, in a very similar way as if you're setting it up manually. The configuration wizard is going to look at a text file with all of the configuration items given particular values. Website mentioned at the bottom there has some really detailed information that I could not find on the Citrix website. Uh, it gives a 
gives detail of what each of the parameters requires needs. Now, you can run the configuration wizard uh, and then record what it is that you want to set up and then it writes it all out. What I find really useful about this particular site, and I think it should be in the Citrix documentation, is that it gives all of those, uh, all that information straight away so you can read and review. Now, we're doing an installation piece, that's cool, uh, scripts to deploy that, that's fine. One of the questions that we asked ourselves when we were uh, developing this slide deck is could you do that from the cloud platform, the Citrix Smart Tools? Uh, smart Tools is available to all customers now, you've got at least Smart Build, um, allowing you to do deployments into your environment from a cloud platform. So could you integrate the scripts, could you integrate a PVS deployment from smart tools, given that it wasn't, uh, wasn't a capability or facility there? Now, the smart tools have a number of different options. They're smart write grade, smart scale, doing exactly what it is that it says in the website. There's a new piece, if you've looked at smart tools before, um, the smart check, which allows you to do some health statuses. And I would recommend uh, looking up on Synergy TV, SYN 103. Uh, Actually, that's possibly wrong. Uh, I will correct that now I look at it again because that says Citrix app layering. Um, there's a really good talk through on the smart check capability to allow you to customize it and modify it for your particular environment. But we're going to look at smart builds. So we're going to use smart build to do PVS deployments across a particular site. So we've got a bit of a demo here and hopefully it auto plays. Oh, look at that. Right, so smart build. Uh, so we're going to use smart build in order to do a Citrix PBS deployment. So here I've got, I have pre-built, uh, using the smart build process, two uh, Windows 2012 VMs. As you can see, nothing up my sleeve for these particular instances. They've got the smart tools agent installed. They've got the uh, default Windows build installed. And now we're going to use the smart tools in order to do the deployment. Now. I'm just going to pause it there. Within Smart Tools, Smart Build, you can create blueprints, which are essentially a group to allow you to do a deployment into any particular environment. So here I've created a blueprint. Hopefully I'll make this available. I've, I've spoken to some people, it's not been available just yet, but hopefully it'll be a community uh, blueprint that you would be able to make use of. And that takes a server. It then robocopies the PVS ISO image from some sort of SMB network share to the host itself, does a .NET, reboots the appliance, does the installations of PVS console PVS server, and then uh, does the configuration wizard. So if I look at the scripts, relatively straightforward. Oh, yes, just the firewall as well. Disable the firewall fully, or it'll create uh, the actual ports open inbound and outbound for a PVS environment. Close. Cool. So I've configured my firewall, done my .NET update, just doing some silent installs of the PVS uh, console and the PVS server. Nice thing about Smart Build is you can have different script types. If you've got PowerShell or if you've got .batch files or VVS scripts, all of them can be put together. Uh, all of those individual scripts can be put together in a blueprint. The Smart Tools, Smart Build framework sorts out the right script running utility. The PDVS deployment takes a number of parameters to build a new farm. Let me just pause that in a second. So here what I do is create the configuration in that hidden directory, dump all of the information in based on what it is that the user wants to do, or the admin wants to do, and then run the configuration message. And then do an output of that as a I'm done, I'm finished. So if we run it, let's do a deploy. So we're going to take the uh, deployment profile. So I've, I have indeed done this before, so I've typed in all of the information uh, just for time. Uh, but what it also means is that you can do this consistently. Say you've got a lab build environment where you want to build out a new PVS environment each time, every time in a consistent way. Smart build lets you do that. So here you see I, I've put in all of my particular parameters and I said that this is a new instance so it's going to create the database in the SQL environment and it's going to uh, create me a brand new farm. 
it now runs through all of the individual pieces. This takes a bit longer uh, than, I guess, about 10, 15 minutes, depending on the reboot cycle of your particular instances. But that one's deployed. So that's the first PVS server in my farm. It's all been finished. It's all clarified, all lovely. And then I'll go and do the other one. Pop, smart build, deploy. And let's run through server two. Select server two. Again, that's my particular instance. Run through here, you'll notice that the new farm is set to false because I've already configured it. Um, away we go, and that will deploy out to that particular instance. Happy days. Again, for brevity, uh, it's not normally this quick. I have edited the video. A bit more editing sort of feels as if it would have been useful at this point in time. Right, so we've got the PBS deployment, and there we go. All lovely, get the deployment state. Obviously has a bit of a whinge because firewall's on, but that's fine because I've opened specific ports. If I log on to the actual servers themselves, as if by magic, all of the PVS pieces are in place, and I can run the PVS console once I stop faffing about. Excuse me. Yep. And I can see my farm. Bosh, bosh, bosh. And I can see that I've got two servers because I've deployed it in two individual instances. So here I've used a number of scripts in order to build out that environment, and I've used Citrix Smart Tools, the Citrix Build function, uh, the Smart Build functionality, in order to provide consistent build each time, every time, based on scripts. And if you want to have a look at those scripts, and maybe you don't want to use Smart Tools, but you just want to use the scripts themselves, I've put all of those scripts uh, on GitHub. By all means, download, contribute if required. So to, just to be clear on that, the, the automation that, that you've written for the PVS deployment is absolutely independent of smart tools, and you can grab those scripts absolutely uh, independent. It's just and run them inside your own environment. Absolutely. In whatever delivery mechanism that, that, that it is that you've got, the key there is that you've got an automated install that you can uh, run through and provision each time, every time, in a consistent manner. Well, that's great. So now I've got my uh, build. I've built the Windows 10 environment or, or the whatever I am delivering. I've built the environment, the service itself. I've automated both of those. I've got a standardized build. That's cool. But you know, no environment survives engagement with the enemy. Anytime you deploy an environment, out of the box it's all lovely and it's all cool, but over time there may well be drift. How can we document that automatically? Jim? Yep. So, um, hopefully many of you have heard of a fellow CTP called uh, Carl Webster. Um, he's written several documentation scripts for various uh, technologies and uh, others as well, um, covering loads of versions. Uh, and let's run the uh, run VT. I think. All right, then just one second. Add those run VT. So if you go to carwebster.com, you can go and download. Uh, you can go and download all of his documentation scripts, which we will now demonstrate to you. Um, my screen is lagging slightly behind uh, yours, Andy, so I will just wait for it to update slightly before I start talking over the video. Oh, it's definitely lagging a few seconds go. behind. Yeah. Uh, still on the demo demo all slide, right. but uh, ah, there we go. So uh, this is Carl Webster's happy. site. Uh, yep, I'm happy. Um, <clears throat> This is the script. Now, Carl's done a great job in each of the scripts to um, put loads of parameter, parameter help, loads of help files, uh, loads of examples in um, for you to go and have a look in, and it, it should work. Um, he's got for PBS. He's got uh, one that works for the old PowerShell uh, PBS, which does strings. Uh, this one we're showing off now is the is the new PowerShell PBS, which actually does proper objects. 
Um, is this actually playing, Andy, or is it paused in some way? I paused. I paused while you caught up. I'm, I'm all and caught up. Playing. There we go. So uh, here's the different uh, parameters. Cool. In the new version of the scripts, uh, there will be even more parameters because uh, Carl's been very diligent and uh, put new code page stuff. You can even get it to email yourself a copy of the document. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at uh, the demo PBS environment here, what Carl's done, Carl Scripts wants to document every single GUI configuration that you can see in the environment. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the properties here, we can see we've got VDIS authentication, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we want to see in the document is all of these settings correct and in the same order. So he's constructed the document in a tree view. Uh, with you know, subject headings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that actually match the way that the uh, GUI looks. Um, so that means that if you're looking for a particular setting, then you can quite easily find that. Um, we'll just wait. Um, I do say, a little bit, mate. yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, when you're running call scripts, I always encourage you to uh, run them with verbose is true because uh, like a good PowerShell script, it doesn't return anything if everything's working correctly. And if you want to see how it's working, then stick the verbose parameter on there. And we can see that that's going along. It's uh, using PowerShell underneath to go and look at every single visible setting. And uh, we'll fast forward again, I think, Andy. And uh, in this case, uh, okay. we're checking it out to a... Word doc. It takes about a minute in my very small demo environment. If you've got a larger environment that's very complex, then it's probably going to take you a little while um, to do. As I say, about a minute there. All right, and let's have a look at the uh, what's produced. So you can get a uh, Word document, as I said, which we're just about to have a look at. Um, the script can be run uh, either signed or unsigned. There we go. I think my my, uh, my screen's lagging a little bit, but that's okay. So you can choose your cover pages, et cetera, et cetera. The amount of times I've spoken to customers and some consultant has charged them four days of work and they've just come in and run Carl's documentation script is quite uh, quite unbelievable. So don't let that give you any ideas, all you people out there, that you should start doing that. It's a very bad thing to do. There's the text file and uh, let's say that there is the HTML file in just a second. Do you want to go back to the HTML file? No, no it's fine. There we go. Happy? Uh, yeah, I'm all good. Yeah. There we are. Um, Cole does all this for free. He maintains uh, 200,000 lines of code, 400,000 downloads. If you do use his stuff, then please go and chuck him a donation. It's, uh, it's a very good idea and, and helps him maintain his lab and justifies all of the time that he spends on this. All right. Cool. Then we can go. Next I think slide. we can. So yeah, we can document automatically. Let's crack on. But then, all right, so we've documented automatically, but can we do even wizzier stuff with that, Jim? Yes. Um, so uh, Pester. Pester is uh, the first open source uh, bit of software that was included in uh, Microsoft Base Build from uh, Windows 10 and Server 2016 onwards. Um, Originally for unit testing PowerShell scripts, but people very quickly realized that you could uh, bend it to another use, which is uh, configuration, configuration testing for infrastructure. To maintain, to make sure that you know whether you've got configuration drift across pods, across sites, and also, even more importantly, across time. Jeffrey Snowber, the inventor of PowerShell, has, uh, I've watched him on stage saying you should be using PowerShell and Pester for this purpose. So let's see how that looks. In a bit of a demo. In a bit of a demo, yeah. Look at that. Cool. 
happy days. So what I did was I took Carl's original PVS documentation script because he's already got the command in there to document uh, all of the uh, GUI settings. I thought that's probably a good line in the sand to draw in, in terms of what settings are important and what settings are not important. But you could add your own in. So I ripped his script apart and rewrote it. And instead of just outputting documents, now it outputs a PowerShell object. Now. The very useful thing about objects rather than a docx file is you can do interesting PowerShell stuff with those objects. And <clears throat> this is a pester test. Ah, this bit is running the um, is running call script which I've changed and we'll get a, an object out of this. Because I'm not creating a document this time, it will run a lot faster. And we can see, once this is run, that uh, I'm going to have a nice PowerShell object, which again, hierarchical, in the same way that the document is, in the same way the GUI is. So you can see all the same uh, information in the object as you would see in the GUI. Now, what Carl does in his scripts is he changes the PowerShell uh, results to match what you see in the GUI. I haven't done that, because uh, I want to pass this information on to other scripts. And we can see there that. Inside, it still works. It still looks at exactly the same stuff with general security groups, etc. So we've got all the great information that we need in there. I haven't included unique stuff, so no IP addresses and that kind of thing, because you want to be able to use the script to check different pods, and you don't want it erroring when it just encounters a different IP address or a different name. So now I'm taking this object, converting it to a JSON file. Uh, any hierarchical data storage file would do, so XML would do uh, just as well as JSON if you wanted to do, do XML. Um, but the world seems to run on JSON nowadays, so let's use JSON. So this is the JSON file, again, as you would expect, because the object was hierarchical and contained all of the correct information, that the JSON file is, again, reflects the object, reflects the GUI, reflects the information in all of those and has everything in it. So now I've got a definitive file which says this is how my environment should look. And I can use that file to then feed in to my pester tests to check how that information should be and compare it to my infrastructure and we'll see that in a second. So this is a pester test and you can see I'm getting the uh, JSON file and I'm also getting um, <clears throat> the information from uh, the PVS form and comparing it to each other. And we see at the top here, I'm just having a look at the version, right? So I'm saying that the version of the PVS form should be greater than or equal to the version in my JSON file. I could have just said equals if I wanted, but greater than equals seems to be a better test in my mind. Um, <clears throat> all down this script, I've written, it's a, this is the wonderful thing about PESTA, right? Because you write very, very simple tests uh, and they sort of read in a bit of English. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run that uh, PESTA test against the farm and against the JSON. Now, bear in mind, we just took this information, so nothing should have changed. So everything should be green, everything should be correct, and it is excellent. So now we've run it once, we check that everything works. Let's change something in the environment. And I could change pretty much anything within the GUI at this point. So I'll just change a couple of things there. Change the cache size, which is important. Printer management, which may also be important to you. And we're going to rerun that pester test. And we get nice and green to start with. But oh, now we've got two bits of red text. Because two of those tests have failed. Because I, now I know, and I can see that what uh, because of pester, it tells me what was expected. 64 but was 4. Now <clears throat> at the moment this is just writing stuff on screen using write host which is no good to man the beast really unless you want to see pretty things. Really what we want to do is take the result of this pester test and then feed it to something else because if you if your environment's configuration has drifted maybe you have um, upgraded and it's reset a value or something of that then you can run it with acquired and pass through parameters to PESTA. And what that will do is it will get you, again, a useful PowerShell object. 
and let's have a look inside that object and we can see that the number of failed tests is now two. And of course, because it's PowerShell, you can now write a little bit of code that says, if failed test is greater than zero, send me an email, raise an alert, pop, do a do pop something useful. screen, do something useful. So you could run this as a scheduled task in the background, or you could run it uh, if somebody else has built a pod, or you can run it if you're a consultant, you've gone back into an environment, then you say, I want to know what's changed since I last was here. And you can use this to do that, to effectively verify your configuration across pods, across sites, and across time. Awesome. Now, uh, you can download, you could download these scripts if I press the right button. I'm going to do that. Lovely. So these scripts are available, yes? Do you can contribute to them on GitHub if yes. you require? Yes. Awesome. There is Citrix PBS Pester Test. Um, I've done this work for Pesta. I may do it for other Citrix technologies because this framework doesn't just apply to PBS, it applies to any possible thing you want to test because you could not even have to test stuff that's in the PBS GUI. You could test services and running, you could test whatever you like. Um, yes. So the the uh, change call script and the Pesta test is in my GitHub, so feel free to, uh, to download and run them and, and test them out. Excellent. So we've talked about image builds, we've talked about the service builds, we've looked at documenting the environment and, run, and using that documentation in order to ensure consistency. Uh, and again, in a break from the SIN 306, let's, let's look at how we can enhance the performance of uh, the delivery of those services across the network. Obviously, um, in a PVS environment, way back at the top, we talked about single network cards. That's all cool. But ideally, what you want is a lot of RAM in those PVS instances, in those PVS server hosts. You want RAM in there so that you can take that image from the disk and store it in RAM. RAM is the fastest delivery mechanism. How can you go about doing that in the best way? Now, when sizing, don't. If we were going to look at it in the best way, don't look at the memory committed bytes in order to work out how much RAM your individual servers are, are using. It's the wrong thing to have a look at. Don't use that particular value. Instead, look at the look at these values. Look at the copy read hits. Look at the I/O data operations per second. What you're trying to do is take is take the the disk image that's on the disk and put that into the system cache so that it's being delivered from memory. These parameters, uh, these um, Windows performance parameters, are going to give you a best idea of when you've got the right amount of RAM, and that is detailed in this uh, in the Citrus article that's mentioned down at the bottom. Because what you want to be doing in terms of your system RAM cache size is looking at the number of active disks, looking at the VDisk read, and then using that to generate your RAM size. Not but you committed bytes, looking at this and then looking at those particular performance statistics. That way that you know that you've sized the RAM in those particular uh, PBS hosts correctly so that you're getting the best performance, so that when all of your VMs are starting up, they're starting up and being served across the network from the PBS servers where that uh, VDisk image is actually being stored in RAM rather than the slower from disk. And indeed, if you've got double check on the version, I thought I got this wrong last time. If you've got a PVS version from 7.7 or beyond, you can take advantage of some new functionality that was introduced in 7.7 in order to speed up the uh, boot process of an individual device. You will know, I am sure, the uh, stack of delivery, so yes, it gets an IP address, bootstraps downloaded, there's a login process goes on the PBS server, and then you start downloading the information. As of PBS version 7.7, if you introduce a second uh, CPU into that instance, that's uh, being the, the, the PBS endpoint, then you can improve the logon time, because the uh, that particular BNI stack process can make use of a second processor, so it improves the performance of that particular individual device. Now, that's not to say that uh, if I put four vCPUs or six or eight that it's going to improve. It's just an extra one. Um, yeah, don't go adding 16 in. That, that's not going to get you any additional performance. 
And let's face it, two vCPUs for uh, for at least for a desktop PC are probably what people should be using anyway. Absolutely, especially in that Windows 10 environment, even with the optimization stuff that's come in. Um, but can you accelerate even further? Now, you may be aware that uh, from Zen Server 7, if you've got PVS 713, you can make use of PVS Accelerator, which is a new functionality that the Zen Server team and the PVS team have worked together on in order to improve uh, the performance of a PVS environment. And essentially how it works is your individual VM instance that's hosted on Zen Server, this is only available on Zen Server, is going to start up and the, the extra piece that you've added into your Zen Server environment, that PVS Accelerator, is going to monitor what's going on at the vSwitch. If the PVS Accelerator, which is essentially a, a cache, has the information locally, it's going to send that back off to the, to the VMs that are starting up. If it doesn't have that information locally, then it goes off to the provisioning server, where ideally it's stored in memory rather than on disk. But if it's not stored in memory, it needs to go to disk. But the key thing there is the PVS accelerator on that local Zen server instance can serve the VM images. So once it's got that data, you can significantly improve the performance of those uh, of the startup of those individual workstations. How do you set it up? It's relatively straightforward. It's a, an additional. It's an additional uh, file on your Zen server environment, and you need 713. Uh, make sure that you've got enough control domain memory. This is um, this almost harks back to our read the documentation uh, issue that we had earlier on. Um, make sure it's got at least four gig of control domain memory. Uh, otherwise, it won't work. That is noted in the documentation. And then you can configure in your Zen server uh, environment how much cache is assigned. You can either have that cache in memory on the Zen server instance, or you can have that cache on disk. Uh, and the thing that I said I would do in terms of uh, updating this particular slide, I have not. I have just realized, oops. Um, then you can see the PVS accelerator. So in a working environment, uh, the PVS accelerators for each of the VMs where you've enabled this uh, shows that you, uh, is displayed so you can see what's going on. Now, what's the impact of that for your particular environment? This is disk I.O. So without Accelerator, now maybe you haven't sized the memory properly, um, so you're going a lot to disk. That's the, a significant amount of disk I.O. But once Accelerator is enabled, then the disk I.O. drops down. That's going to improve the performance of your PVS host. But where you really see it is in the network utilization. Um, because the Accelerator, the PVS Accelerator capability in Zen Server is caching that information, it doesn't need to go across the network, so you improve the you improve the boot delivery time, uh, reduce the CPU on the PVS server, improve the performance and consistency of delivery for your end users. And if you need to, if you need to monitor that environment, we're all about monitoring and making sure that everything goes well. Uh, there are a number of extra PVS accelerator metrics that are available in your Zen server environment, but it does require a Zen server. This isn't available on VMware, it's not available on Hyper-V. Really makes the case for using Accelerator. Thanks very much. It really does make the case for using I, I, I remember talking about this in uh, E2E at Sydney, where um, a couple of people were actually now thinking about moving to Zen Server uh, because they could make use of this functionality, which is something that uh, they found alien to them. But, but there you go. So we've looked at improving performance. We've looked at documentation. We've looked at automating the delivery build. But if you remember, right back at the top, there was a uh, one of the CEIP things was quite often you're using local data stores in order to store your VDisk images. And as Jim mentioned, it's all about ensuring that that's consistent across pods. How do you replicate? Yes. Now, I'll let you take this one, Jim. Yeah. So uh, before Synergy, uh, I thought that it'd be a really good idea to try and uh, take the effort out of people looking up the 8,000 different Robocopy parameters and uh, maybe put a little GUI around it to, because um, one of my little hobbies is, is writing WPF GUIs for PowerShell. I know, odd hobby, but there you go. And I thought I'd write a nice uh, GUI on, a, on the back of some PowerShell scripting so you could automate and present as a tool. And I did quite a lot of work on this. Um, 
and I uh, got it almost finished. I was going to present it as a tool that everybody could download, and I was very proud of it. And then, in April, <laughs> just before Synergy, your man Samuel releases a tool. Which is exactly doing what I was going to do. <laughs> exactly doing what it is that you were going to do. And there was swearing and much gnashing of teeth. There um, was. There was. Uh, uh, yeah, I decided not to release mine because I'm just some bloke from the internet, and he's from Citrix. Oh, <laughs> yeah. in, in, indeed. Uh, and when we were at the Irish Citrix user group, um, one of the guys who was there was sat in the front, was looking at this. You know, I looked attentive throughout the whole thing, and then saw this slide, and bless him, his, his little face crumpled up because he just spent about a week creating a very similar tool. Um, so if you were thinking about creating a replication tool, have a look, oh. download this read disk replicator. Yeah, yes, because it sets everything up uh, right. Uh, there's a couple of things. It does use um, PowerShell. Oh, that word's gone. Remote remoting. Just use PowerShell remoting. Uh, so if that's not turned on, the tool won't work. Indeed, this is mentioned in the documentation. Uh, there's almost a theme here. Is read the docs. Um, it is mentioned in the documentation, you do have to turn it on. But once you've turned it on and once you've run the script, you get a nice little interface or WinForms, which you're not entirely happy about, Jim. But WinForms but just is just dead, but you know, that's nitpicking to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so uh, you specify your export, specify your import, select which stores you want to do, select which images, and then it outputs. You'll, you'll notice there at the bottom right the output CLI. So you can output the command line that should be generated, so you can put that into whatever automation piece, schedule piece that you need to do, so that it's working automatically. So as we approach the top of the hour, um, let's bring it all together. Yes, uh, right, right back at the top, we. I'll do the things that we wanted to do, and you do the things that we did. Yeah? What we wanted to do was talk about consistency. We wanted to help you automate the environment, because in automation you get consistency. Uh, we, we had issues with the actual image builds themselves. How could you how could you work on that? We talked about the service environment, so actually the PBS services themselves. We talked about documentation. We talked about checking. Um, how could you, yeah, how could all of those help in ensuring a consistent environment? Anything yes. Else? No, I, th I think that's it. So I, I think we've covered pretty much all of those. So we've, we've enabled you either through stuff we've written to fill in the gaps or, or stuff that was already available as free to use resources on the uh, in internet that you can now automate, document, and validate your entire PBS, PBS infrastructure from soup to nuts, no matter whether you're a very small or a very large organization. Hopefully, that's been useful to you guys, uh, and hopefully you'll use at least some of the tools that we've uh, had a look at today. Indeed. Um, in terms of next steps, yes, the session is recorded. Uh, yes, uh, the the Checkpoint slides will be available, so you can follow through all of the links. Um, by all means, contribute to the PESA testing that James done, or the PVS delivery scripts that I've done. And there's been a note uh, put in on the questions about uh, syncing up with Samuel about changing the delivery mechanism of the replicator tool. We'll, we'll try and follow that up. I, th I think if there was if there was a thing to talk to Samuel about, it, about making that tool available on GitHub or, or something similar so that people could contribute to it. Um, we'll try and follow that up. We'll try and follow yeah. that up. Yeah, C C Citrix is a bit weird at the moment about uh, open source. Uh, I know that there's internal discussions at Citrix to try and change their attitude towards open source tools, but uh, yes, having that on a publicly available GitHub so we can do pull requests would be amazing. Yes, it would be. Uh, we will talk to Samuel about that as our takeaway. Um, if there are any questions, by all means, put them in the channel. I almost said Slack channel there, and it's not Slack, is it? Because it's, it's the thing. Yeah. Um, so we have been answering all the questions that we could along the way uh, and made the answers public uh, where relevant. Um, so we'll just uh, give it another... I'll tell you, why don't, why don't we let Stephanie do the outro, and if there is uh, any questions, we'll just grab them at the very end. Absolutely. Stephanie, would you like to take it away? Sure. 
let me take the screen back. Um, you'll see in the chat window that I have put in a link to a survey, which is very quick and anonymous, and we'd love to have you fill it out and tell us what you thought. Um, helps us plan future webinars. I have also put a link into a forum thread at mycugc.org. We've opened up a thread for this event so you can ask more questions. You know, they might come to you later. I <laughs> will make sure that Jim and Andrew <clears throat> see them and uh, get them answered for you. And I also just want to remind everyone to visit us at mycugc.org. That's where our recording will live. You'll get an email with a link to the recording also. And uh, go out there and find your local group. Maybe join a special interest group. We have ones for healthcare, special uh, interest group for government, uh, federal, state, and local, um, networking. And also to get up to speed on what other webinars are coming and some post synergy content that we are continuously adding to the site. So. Are there so, any other questions that came in you want to answer, guys? Uh, there's one last question from uh, Amadeep, which is a, a awful question in the term. <laughs> that he's, he's asked it at the very last second. It's a very long and complicated answer. So, Amadeep, it is. I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer that in full because we don't have time. But yes, uh, the easy, the very, very simple way question is suck it and see. And if you're out of space, make it more. <laughs> Um, uh, test and validate is what is, is what I've I've put just in case suck it and see sounds a little rude. Um, <laughs> but yes, it it is it is a complicated one to uh, to answer. Ideally, you're looking at your particular environment. There are some notes of documentation. I tell you what, Jim, we'll follow this up and we'll send some tweets about it. Yes, yes. Catch us up. How about that? After, yes, yeah, catch, after, catch us up. After, yeah, after, after the session, just uh, just catch us up. It's uh, at Jim or at Andy M Wood, um, and we'll we'll do our best to guide you in, to resources that are already available. Is it yeah. uh, more about the impact between the old and the new caching methods? Again, uh, same thing. Amadeep, catch catch us later, because um, we are right at the end of the hour. So I yeah, I'll tell you what, Amadeep, I'll I'll put the links to the presentation that we did last year. At um, at Synergy, where we talked about uh, the different methods and the updates that are in version seven and the performance impacts that that has. Hopefully, that might answer your question. And if it doesn't, uh, at Jim Moyle and at Andy and Wood, uh, and we'll we'll do our best to help you or, or guide you as to where you can get, find that information. Splendid. P E R. I'm a is happy. Um, and if he's uh, if they are happy, if customers are happy, if all of the people who've been listening are happy. I'm happy to. Uh, thanks very much, I think. All right. Cheers, guys. All right. Thanks. Everyone have a great day. All right, then.